Welcome, everybody. If you're working on your art portfolio, you're going to love this interview with Clara Liu from Rhode Island School of Design, one of the best schools out there. I get so many requests to look at your portfolio for this school. And so we're lucky to have a really great art professor who works there speaking with us today to tell us about how to prepare an art portfolio and some of the questions you might have when selecting a college as well, whether you're a parent or a student considering going into the art and design. Uh, Clara is going to give us some really good insights today. Um, so welcome, Clara, and I would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Some people who are considering Rhode Island maybe already know about you, but there could be lots of people out there that don't know. You do mm -hmm. have a fantastic uh, art uh, website, claraliu.com, and then you have a blog that you write regularly, and you write for the Huffington Post with Ask the Art Prof. And you've got some fantastic insights uh, where you're answering all kinds of questions about art and how to make a portfolio, all those things. So it's so wonderful to hear from you today, Clara. So maybe start by telling us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been working uh, and teaching at Rhode Island, and maybe a little bit about your own education so that the students and their families kind of get a little idea of, of who you are and where you've been. I actually started at RUSD in 1993 when I attended the RUSD pre-college program. So I was at RISD the summer of my junior year. I did that program, and then two years later, I was accepted as an undergraduate student. So I spent a lot of time at RISD as an undergrad, but that RISD pre-college program really solidified a lot of things for me. You know, it was only a six-week program, but I still consider that to be sort of a major milestone in my art career. Um, after that, I took four years off and tried to work independently as an artist. Um, and then I went back to graduate school at the New York Academy of Art in um, New York City. And then I got a teaching position at Concord Academy, which is a high school preparatory program. Um, I taught at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts for four years. I taught at the Art Institute of Boston. I finally landed back at RISD in 2007, where I've been since then. You, you seem so passionate about teaching uh, so much so that you write about it regularly and your, your, your passion really shines through in your answers and how much you love working with students. Um, could you maybe share with me a little bit about why you chose to go into teaching, not just doing your art? So just kind of curious about that, that how you bring the passion for the arts into your teaching or how the teaching comes into your art. Mm -hmm. Well, I think my studio practice and my teaching definitely inform and support each other. In other words, I could never really see a situation where I only had one and I didn't have the other. You know, people say to me all the time, oh, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to teach and, you know, you were independently wealthy, you could just work on your artwork all the time. And actually, my answer to them is, well, no, actually. I would much rather sustain my teaching practice with my studio practice at the same time because the two of them are so critical to my identity as an artist. So. I find that to be um, really important. And actually, the funny thing about teaching is I actually ended up in teaching by accident. It wasn't on purpose. Um, when I was a RUSI student doing my undergraduate degree, I um, used to teach at art camps in the summer for elementary school students. So when I got out of RISD, that was really the only sort of work experience that I had at that stage. So I thought, OK, well, I've taught art at the elementary school level. Why don't I try to do that as a job? And then I ended up loving it so much that I never really kind of looked back. So it's kind of funny that I, I never really said, I'm going to be a teacher today. You know, I just sort of ended up doing it and ended up loving it passionately. So it's, it's kind of fun the way things turned out. Yeah, well, I love teaching, too. Uh, I used to teach at uh, Sheridan College, which is a really good arts college in Canada, in Ontario. And I just loved it so much. I love working with the students. And I love working at that really, that high level where people are so 
the students are just so dedicated and happy to be there because it's hard to even get into some of these colleges. And so it's really exciting to work with those kinds of students. And today, I work with students helping them follow their goals and dreams of going to their dream college. And it's so rewarding, uh, especially working with young people. They're not certain if they can get in and, right. and if they're good enough. And they don't, they're kind of confused how to put a portfolio together. And then they're just so pleased when they get a little bit of insight in how to do that and develop some of their skills so they can really show their ideas and, and embark on a new period of their life. And so I absolutely agree with you. I love to still paint and draw and sculpt and design, but I just love working with students. So it's so nice to speak with somebody that, that isn't teaching just to try to support their art, but it's part of them. And I have found, like you, that I learn from teaching. Oh, absolutely. And I found there was a period of time when I was working at Sheridan and didn't really have as much time to paint as I thought I might. Mm -hmm. And and I came back to it some years later and I was amazed my work had progressed, even mm -hmm. though I hadn't been actually painting. It was right. because of working with those students all the time. You're still creating and processing in your mind, right? Absolutely. And so I found that I became a very strong artist and a strong instructor because of that experience when I sort of started to bring it more together where I was painting and teaching at the same time rather than one or the other. So it's kind of cool to hear somebody else saying that. The question I often get, I guess from students mostly, is, you know, where should I study? Mm -hmm. What should I study? And then how do I get into that school? How would you guide a student in selecting a career in the arts that's kind of right for them? Mm -hmm. uh, and do you ever get that kind of question? I mean, normally you're assessing portfolios that are coming in for your program right. and judging whether they're going to be, you know, an appropriate student for your program and if your program is appropriate for them. But if you could talk to students early on when they're making that selection process, what would you tell them? Um, I think I would tell them to not worry about whether or not they think the subject they choose is going to make money in the future because I hear students voicing a lot of concern about well if I go into this major it doesn't make a lot of money and this one does and I, I think it's um, not okay to assume that a given subject automatically makes money and that one automatically does not make money down the line because ultimately what I find all artists do is that they pave their own paths and you are sort of the one to decide whether or not you can make it a career or not and I think I hear students say all the time oh well I want to go into graphic design because I can make money with that later and I'm going well you know you might think that's the case but what if you decide that you don't want to work very hard and you're not going to challenge yourself and you're not going to work um, at your practice how are you going to make money then? You know, it doesn't matter what you're studying if you're being lazy about your studio practice. You know, and I've also had students say, oh, well, you know, I can't go into painting because that won't make a career for me later. And, you know, I say to them, you know, I know people who do it, so why shouldn't you be one of them, you know? So I think that um, the assumption that certain subjects are more profitable than others is really inaccurate and very off. So I tell the students, you know, you have to pursue what you're passionate about. You have to pursue what you really believe in because if you're choosing something just for monetary reasons, then, you know, where's the passion? Right. And, you know, I remember being one of those young students. <laughs> mm -hmm. I knew since I was three years old that I wanted to paint and I loved art. And... You know, and I came from a family where we grew up on a farm, and uh, the idea of going into the arts was very foreign to my parents, and mm -hmm. they were worried about it. And and I think there's probably a false idea that all artists starve. Right. I think you're right. It depends what you bring to it and the attitude you bring to it and how determined and disciplined you are uh, to follow after your passion. So. I chose to go into interior design mm -hmm. because I thought it was somehow a mixture between architecture that I didn't think I was quite good enough uh, in 
you know, physics and mathematics to do it. So I chose instead, uh, maybe I should do commercial art. Then I thought, well, no, that would be painful because it's too close to art, but not art. So I decided mm -hmm. on interior design because I thought, I could do that. And I don't have to do grade 13 because at the time we had grade 13. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, being a young person, I was 18, I didn't really know. And that's what I chose to do. I did have a good career. And I did excel in it, and I loved it. But I have to tell you, my favorite class was the drawing class. I had this fantastic <laughs> sort of hippie-type artist who didn't belong in any other way in that interior design department. But she was so passionate, and I learned so much from her. And I remember saying to her, I think it was second semester of my first year, and I said, you know, I don't know if I should be doing this. Like, I really love to, I want to be an artist. Do you think I could ever be an artist? And she said, Yes, if that's what you are in your heart and soul, then you are and you will do it and you'll be okay. You know, and I hear from so many people, whether they're in animation or architecture or painting or printmaking or graphics, you have to be passionate and you have to love it. And you know what's interesting? I did have a good career in design and I'm glad that I did what I did. I, I got some good skills that certainly have served me well in my life. But I wasn't ultimately happy, and I left a fantastic job in Toronto. My parents thought, you're nuts. <laughs> I was designing buildings all over the world for Cadillac Fairview, a big developer here in Canada. And and, um, and I wasn't happy because really I'm a fine artist. So I went back to school to study my fine art degree and studied in Europe, in Italy, and Paris. And you know, ultimately, I think you need to do that. And there's so many mature students that I help that they're doing something else, they're not happy, they're getting depressed, they're either trying to do something that they feel they can make a living at or that their parents want them to do and they realize, no, I really got to go for this. And a lot of times those are the students that come to me and say, can you help me because I got to change my life, I need to learn how to draw, and I need to get in. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to one of the questions that I wanted to ask you um, is the the importance of learning how to draw and one of the things uh, when you're talking about portfolios if you go to your uh, blog or any of your entries in the Huffington Post you talk a little bit about portfolio mm -hmm. and I remember reading that you said you thought it was really important in a student portfolio to see drawing that was done by and rather than from photograph so I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that of why you feel that that's so important well, I think drawing from life, if I were to s describe it, drawing from life is an experience. In other words, when you draw something from direct observation, it forces you to really engage with the subject in a way that a photograph does not. Um, for example, I was just in the Nature Lab last week at RISD where they have all sorts of incredible specimens from nature that students can observe and they can draw and I just love the sort of um, ambiance of that room. There's something about all of the activity and all of the specimens that are in there and just getting into that room alone is such an experience. Um, the way it smells, the sounds that are in that room, those are the kinds of things that you will not get from a photograph. Um, you'll never know what your subject smelled like. You'll never know what your subject looked like from the other side. You won't be able to touch it. You won't be able to stand on top of it, look at it from a different point of view. There's just so much you miss out on when you're drawing from a photograph. And um, I think that a lot of drawing is learning how to see. A lot of people say, oh, well, drawing's just about, you know, what you do with your hand and what you're physically your hand is doing. But actually, I think more than half of drawing is really learning how to visually investigate something in a very deep way. Um, and the only way you can truly be a part of that process is to observe something in real life. Because a photograph just does not offer even remotely that kind of experience. There's that, there's other things, for example, a photograph is flat, so if you're trying to make something look three-dimensional from something that's already flat, that seems like a really big contradiction that doesn't really work out very well. 
a photograph is already edited for you. There are compositional choices that have already been made that are not your own. So I think that for those reasons, um, that's why I argue really working from life. Um, working from life is harder. It's a lot more challenging. And it really um, gets you to sort of process things in a different way. And working from a photograph is so much easier, but it's a really sort of bad shortcut that I see a lot of people doing that really doesn't help you in the end. In fact, what it does is it gets you to develop a lot of really bad habits in your drawing skills, which I think are very difficult to kind of undo at a later stage. So I really tell students, you know, if you want to get ahead in the game, draw from life. Skip the photographs altogether. There will be a time and a place for that, but right now is not that time.